Francis Collins received his bachelor's degree from the University of Virginia, a PhD in physical chemistry from Yale University, and an MD from the University of North Carolina. He returned to Yale where he did a fellowship in human genetics, then joined the faculty of the University of Michigan. Among his notable research achievements are discoveries of the genes responsible for cystic fibrosis, neurofibromatosis, Huntington disease, and Hutchison-Guilford progeria syndrome. In 1993, he was wooed to the NIH to become the director of the National Human Genome Project, championing public access to the genetic code of human life and valiantly laboring for fairness and justice on behalf of persons with genetic conditions. He is a member of the Institute of Medicine and the National Academy of Sciences. Last fall, the American Society of Human Genetics honored him for his lifetime contributions to human genetics research. Tonight, we have welcomed him as a fellow in the American Scientific Affiliation. All this is remarkable, yet overshadowed in the light of his unabashedly public identification of himself as a devout Christian. As such, he is an enigma to many scientists. I know of no other scientist who speaks so openly and eloquently of the worshipful harmony between science and Christian faith as Francis Collins. This week marks the publication of his book titled, The Language of God, A Scientist Presents Evidence for Belief. I cannot recall a book receiving such pre-publication press as this one, which includes a three-page article in Time magazine titled, Reconciling God and Science and appearances on national broadcast media have followed regularly. Copies of his book are available for discounted sale in the ASA bookstore, and after his presentation, he will be signing copies of his book. This evening, he is speaking to us on the language of God a believer looks at the human genome. Please join me in a warm welcome for Francis Collins. Thanks, Bud, for a really wonderfully warm introduction. I've been looking forward to this evening for some time since it was possible to work this all out, and I'm really interested in when we get to the questions uh, to have some discussion with all of you. And I'm even wondering if maybe those cards could be passed out a little earlier so people could be writing down things and not have uh, sort of a crunch time at the, uh, at the last minute. So if that's possible, we might think about doing that so people have them in front of them as the questions come up. But I want to thank you for just wonderful leadership of this meeting. And also, since I am uh, from somebody who lives inside the Beltway, it would not be proper for me to stand up here to address you without recognizing that we have a member of Congress with us this evening, Congressman Vernon Elder Ehlers uh, from Michigan. Very nice to see you, Congressman. Congressman is both a member of the Advisory Council to uh, ASA and a physicist, and so it's wonderful to have him here, and I know he's going to be speaking later in the meeting. I thought I'd say a word about my own faith pathway because maybe it's uh, relevant to what I'm going to tell you as far as this presentation on the human genome. Uh, I did not grow up in a home where faith was practiced. I did not go to a Christian college. By the time I was a PhD student in physical chemistry at Yale, I was an atheist. I decided that the only thing that really mattered uh, were mathematics and physics. I loved those second order differential equations <laughs> that many of my friends found inscrutable. But along the way, I had this sense uh, that maybe I had not jumped into the right pathway as far as my professional life. And I had a bit of a crisis about what to do next and ended up changing course completely and going to medical school. And in medical school, in that third year where you find yourself out there in the hospital wards and clinics interacting with patients who have terrible diseases that they did, for the most part, nothing to bring on themselves, and as I was in North Carolina uh, listening to these patients recount their stories and finding how many of them really were leaning on their faith as a source of strength at a time where everything else seemed to be crumbling around them. I got rather curious about that. And one afternoon, a wonderful woman who was a patient of mine who had really terribly advanced coronary artery disease, uh, for which we really had not much we could offer, 
after sharing her faith with me, she turned and looked me in the eye and said, so what do you believe? And I hadn't really been asked that question before. And I stammered and stuttered and said, well, I don't think I believe any of what you've just said. But it felt very thin, that answer. And it bothered me because it seemed to me that I was becoming aware that I'd made a decision about faith that a scientist shouldn't make. That is, I decided to be an atheist without considering the evidence. It was convenient being an atheist, not being answerable to anybody, uh, surrounded by lots of temptations and not having to worry too much about the consequences. But you know, if there was an important question for any of us to ask, the most important question it seemed to be is, is there a God and does he care about me? And I hadn't really considered what the answer to that question might be based on evidence. So convinced at that point that atheism was the right answer, but that I'd better darn well strengthen my arguments so I didn't get put in an embarrassing position again, I went about trying to learn something about the face of the world and got very confused because I really couldn't understand much of what I was reading in the Cliff Notes versions of uh, Judaism, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, and so on. It didn't occur to me to read the original text, of course. That would have been a little too time consuming. And so I walked down the street one day in my uh, little town of Carborough, North Carolina, and I knocked on the door of the office of a Methodist minister who lived on the street, and I explained to him my desire to understand more about this so that I could refute it. And uh, he uh, smiled and said, well, you know, I think there's a book that might help you because it's written by somebody who was on the same pathway that you seem to be on, and he was also uh, a bit of an intellectual, so uh, why don't you take this home and read it? And he took down a little book from his shelf, and I took it home and opened it up. And by now you figured out this was C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity. And in that very first chapter, right and wrong, as a clue to the meaning of the universe, all of my arguments about the irrationality of faith lay in ruins. And I realized that my own conclusions had basically been those of a schoolboy, not really uh, those of somebody who'd given the, the matter any serious consideration. That was very unsettling. I spent the next two years uh, re really trying to run away from that conclusion. Over the course of time, I did become convinced that just based on pure logic, it was more reasonable to believe in God than not to. But I also became very aware that you don't get all the way to faith on pure logic. You have to make that decision. And after many considerations about what kind of faith might appeal to me, the person of Jesus Christ loomed ever larger as I realized that this really was a person unlike any other. This was not just a man who claimed to know God, this was a man who claimed to be God. And this very much seemed to be God in search of me, just not me in search of God. And talking to many other Christians in my environment, including some scientists, some physicians, who I'm really glad that God put in my path, I ultimately felt this was just an irresistible conclusion. Uh, the historical evidence for Jesus Christ was very overwhelming to me and the desire to give my life to him finally culminated on a beautiful afternoon hiking in the Cascade Mountains in the shadow of really beautiful uh, natural scenery when I could no longer resist. And I fell on my knees and gave my life to Christ at age 27. 